Hi, everyone, and welcome back um, to the session on providing feedback uh, by, by myself and uh, Dr. Kaylee Johnson. What I thought we'd do, just to kind of ease us into the process, um, hopefully we are all used to, in some capacity, giving some feedback. So what I'd like you to do is, in the chat over here, I would like you to imagine that there is an evil instructor who's grading student papers and uh, what is the worst piece of feedback that you can imagine this evil instructor giving their students? So take a minute, type it in the chat, and then I will say uh, enter, and we all press enter and see um, see what we come up with. So we've got a minute to think about what's the worst piece of feedback you can imagine giving a student. All right, I see a couple of coming in. If we can start putting in, um, here we go. Uh, you clearly didn't even try. Are you kidding? And oh dear, great, fantastic, amazing. You're the best. Um, unclear. I think you should go to the writing center. No feedback at all. Disappointing. Should have uh, listened better. Yowza. A very general, very vague and very bad. <laughs> We're quite familiar with, with what bad feedback is. Um, and part of this was inspired by some techniques that Lucas Wright and Will Engel and the, the team um, spoke about. But part of it was also inspired by this Reddit post from RUBC, which was about a month ago. And they said, what's the harshest feedback you've ever gotten on an assignment? And here are, I think, some of the co top contenders. One student said that they just got a series of question marks on one of their assignments. One of the students said, reading your introduction was like being a blindfolded hostage led through an obstacle course. Which I feel was particularly harsh. Um, I had a prof at my last college who would just write awkward beside any sentences she didn't like. Not particularly harsh, but it was probably some of the most useless feedback I've received. Um, the teacher uh, literally wrote system.out.println, maybe computer science is not for you. Um, I dropped out of the class and now work as a professional movie watcher. Uh, my prof told me that my final paper was disappointing and said I disregarded everything we had learned in the course. I didn't think so. I won't say the name, but it was, um, it was a first year course. And so we see over here that, you know, as sometimes assumptions are made and feedback that are go against what the students actually, the time and effort that they've put in over here. And we see that this feedback is not useful at all. And, you know, at, apart from it being, you know, just writing awkward and it not being useful, it can be at worst demotivating. Now, one student who said that they dropped the course and now a professional um, movie watcher. And so now, you know, we've got this question, well, how do we give the right type of feedback? Uh, when is it appropriate to give feedback? When is it appropriate not to give feedback? And so we find generally within the feedback literature, there are several questions, but they can kind of be lumped under the umbrella of um, what goes into feedback, like what it makes good feedback in terms of co content and when to provide feedback. I'm quickly going to look at this question of, well, when do we provide feedback? Because there's a whole literature. So this Kulik and Kulik is a meta-analysis saying that it's best to provide it immediately. At the same time, this is a narrative literature review saying that it's best to delay the feedback. And then this is some results from uh, looking at many classes um, experiment, an experiment where they had um, a handful of classes looking at timing of feedback. And it says, well, it doesn't really matter. So um, even over here within when is best to provide feedback, you can find literature saying best immediately, delayed, or doesn't really matter. So where does this kind of leave us with um, when to provide feedback? Harrison Rosenfeld sort of in 1985 already stated that, well, um, feedback timing is important, but it, what is perhaps more important is focusing on the content rather than the timing of the feedback. So then this is what I'm going to focus on for uh, the rest of uh, the session is what is the content that goes into providing good feedback? So um, to be able to do this, I would like us to be able to answer these questions by the end of this um, session. What are the broad types of feedback that exist? Which are best of these broad types? Is feedback only effective in summative assessment? What role does or what role can feedback play in formative assessment? Should you use text feedback or audio feedback? 
And do you always need to include rich feedback? And so hopefully by now we'll have a good understanding of what makes good feedback, when to provide it, and how to provide it. Now, I am a, a psychologist, and so I am inherently data-driven. And I'm going to be showing a number of things called Cohen's Ds. And Cohen's Ds um, are what are known as, as effect sizes. Um, and these effect sizes tell us about the difference between two groups in terms of a standard deviation unit. So if you've got one group that doesn't re receive feedback and one group that does receive feedback, this Cohen's D can tell us about, um, and we see that there's a difference between the two groups, this um, Cohen's D can tell us about how big is this effect size. Now, typically some benchmarks, Cohen's D of 0.3 is considered small, a Cohen's D of 0.5 is considered a medium effect size, and a Cohen's D of 0.8 is considered a large effect size. Now, one thing that I particularly like about effect size, especially if we're thinking about it in terms of formative assessment, but especially in terms of summative assessment, just looking at the impact that this can have on students and student performance. Um, my midterm that I had two weeks ago had a standard deviation of 14.5%. So the standard deviation talks about the spread of the data. And so there was a, a standard deviation of 14.5%. Now let's say that I go and take a um, approach to providing feedback and the Cohen's D associated with this is, is 0.5. And so what this means is that I can expect there to be 14.5% times a Cohen's D of 0.5, a 7.2% difference in my class who received this particular intervention versus those who didn't receive that intervention. So for me, these Cohen's Ds are quite nice, they're quite interpretable. If we know what the standard deviation is, we can kind of see, well, what does that translate um, for students? And I think it helps contextualize the size of the um, effect. So feedback, uh, is it effective? Well, we see that, yes, um, it is one of the most studied um, which made a lot of literature review to comb through for today, but it's one of the most studied pedagogical tools that we have. And you can see that by the number of meta-analyses. So meta-analyses are sort of statistical summaries of all the studies that have been done on a topic. And so for instance, Kluger and Denethi in 96 published a meta-analysis of 131 different studies into a meta-analysis, and there were 12,000 participants um, in this meta-analysis, and they found that um, feedback interventions typically had a Cohen's D associated with 0.38%. Um, Cohen's D, over here we go to 2020, the Wisniewski, um, with um, using another 994 effect sizes with 61,000 participants, found a Cohen's D of 0.55, um, Meta-analysis from 81, a Cohen's D of 0.6. Another meta-analysis from uh, early 2000, a Cohen's D of 0.71. Um, Hattie has done a lot of work, and um, there's uh, a lot of really good research that Hattie's done and, and provided a number of really good um, outputs on various pedagogical innovations. Um, one of Hattie's uh, books that they've published is a review of 800 meta-analyses on pedagogical innovation. So if you're looking for that, that's a very good way, um, a very good place to start. And they found that um, sort of these effect sizes for feedback range from 0.7 to 0.79. So we see um, at worst, um, providing feedback has a small to medium effect size. And at best, we, have, we see this... Um, feedback provides a, a rather large effect size for student learning. Now, um, this Wisniewski paper said that there's, you know, as you see, we go from 0.38 to 0.79. We kind of cover the gamut of small effect size, medium and large effect size. And they take note of the substantial variance in effect size because there's different types of feedback that we can give. And we can break this down into two basic buckets. The one being evaluative feedback, and the other one being descriptive feedback. So an evaluative feedback is receiving a grade back on something. So quite often with summative assessment, you get a grade, and that's what that gives you some feedback as to how you did it. Not a lot of information, um, 
but it gives you some feedback. You can have written praise. And we actually saw at the beginning, one of you said, uh, great, fantastic, amazing, you're the best. And this is written praise. And this comes from a behaviors point of view that if we provide um, if we provide a positive reinforcement, then students will want to do the thing that got that positive reinforcement. At the same time, we can look at criticisms. Why did you even bother? You're wasting my time. What are you doing here? Print line. Uh, why are you stunning this class? And also judgments. And then also just sort of um, evaluative is also just sort of giving right or wrong, giving correct or incorrect. And all of these fall under some sort of evaluation of performance. But what you see is that they don't really give any indication as to, well, what, why was it right? Or why was it wrong? And so this is when we get into descriptive feedback that provides information about what was done, uh, what has been considered, what was right, and then where does improvement need to um, be made. And we can see that this descriptive feedback kind of aligns with the main goals of feedback because feedback is trying to fill this gap between what is understood by a student and what we want a student to understand. And not only students, you know, we have these student evaluations of teachings, we have peer reviews of teachings, we want to get feedback from our colleagues or from our students because we are interested in where is the gap between um, what we do pedagogically and how can we improve pedagogically. When we look at um, students, they express a desire for feedback. So Higgins found that students absolutely express a, a desire for feedback. And Butler and Nissen, in a really interesting paper from 1986, say that students prefer having descriptive feedback rather than evaluative uh, feedback. And so when we look at this type of evaluative feedback, praise, grade, critique, we see that this kind of feedback um, is not informative to the student. Uh, it may have no impact on the student beyond the realization that they got the answer right or they got the answer wrong. So uh, evaluative feedback, while does contain some information, you heard um, our keynote yesterday, Cynthia Brame, talking about corrective feedback. Um, it doesn't really sort of give any indication as to where students can improve. So now, um, looking at the Winiski paper, uh, they kind of delineated feedback into three um, types of feedback. Punishment and reinforcement, which falls under evaluative. And this comes from sort of behaviorist principles in psychology, that if you praise someone doing something, then they will repeat that thing that got the praise. If you criticize someone or you do some aversive consequences to that person, they don't like aversive consequences, so they'll stop doing that thing. And so uh, feedback was, was sort of designed or can be designed according to these behaviorist principles. You also get these corrective feedbacks, and that's just information about task level. And that's what um, uh, Cynthia Brain was talking about yesterday in part of her keynote, where it's just, you got this right, you got this wrong, and then you can either provide the right answer alongside this or not. And then you get high information feedback, and this falls more towards this descriptive feedback um, where you talk about some sort of uh, description about the performance, what was done right, what is good, what is correct about it, and then where improvements can be made. And uh, this is corrective, it corrects any misconceptions, and it stimulates reflection on the learning process for the student. Now, why I mentioned this punishment corrective and high information feedback is because this Winiski meta-analysis that looked at over, I think, what was it, um, 61,000 students um, with, uh, what was it? Uh, I forget how many effect sizes uh, there was. Um, they looked at this effect size from students who had punishment and reinforcement compared to those who didn't have those who had corrective right, wrong versus those who didn't, and those who had really good high quality information versus those who didn't. And we see this punishment and reinforcement um, giving praise or giving some sort of aversive um, response to feedback does actually improve students' performance, but we see it's a rather small effect size. When we look at corrective feedback, just right or wrong, 
we can see that that then almost doubles this effect size, where we start going from small up to in a medium effect size. When we look at high information, I would like you to just look on the graph and where do you think on the graph would high information feedback fall? What effect size would you expect to see? Because when I read this paper and I saw this effect size, we see that it's almost students perform a full standard deviation better when they get this high information feedback compared to when they do not get high information feedback. I see over here Tamara saying that many students are focused on the grade. They often don't even look or consider the feedback. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later and where that is um, one of the issues when it comes to summative assessment, but where I think formative assessment has um, uh, something to say about that. So, so far, we've looked at what are the broad types of uh, feedback. We've put them into these two buckets, evaluative and descriptive. Um, we looked at validative being things like punishment, reinforcement, and um, just corrective feedback versus descriptive, which contains a lot of information about what was done correctly and where improvement can be made. We see that this high information descriptive feedback is based. Um, it can lead to a standard deviation improvement in outcomes for students. Um, and typically that is reflected in an improved grade because they take the feedback, they integrate the feedback, and then uh, do that for the next thing that their next assignment that they hand in. Um, what role does or can feedback play in formative assessment? So this is where Tamara kind of hit the nail on the head. Because when we look at summative assessment, getting a final grade, um, we saw already that students really desire descriptive feedback and students not only want, sorry, they really desire feedback, but not only do they want feedback, but they want descriptive feedback. However, when you provide in a summative assessment, descriptive feedback with a grade, um, students actually don't read the feedback presented with the grade. They just look at the grade and take that on. And so within summative assessment, um, research has shown that providing descriptive assessment um, feedback with a grade for summative assessment does not lead to improved grades on a subsequent summative task. We see Sinclair and Cleland um, looking at medical students and they had a paper graded, they received their grades back electronically, and then looked at how many students actually came and collected their paper with the descriptive feedback. Um, and this is within in the field of medicine, and they found that 50% of the students didn't even come and get their paper with descriptive feedback. And then as I sort of alluded to earlier, when you're providing descriptive feedback with a grade on summative assessment, it doesn't lead to improvement on future tasks. So you can see how this becomes immediately a little bit tricky because how do we provide feedback that is effective, that is unaccompanied by a grade? And that's rather difficult to do within summative assessment. And so what do we do? We look towards formative assessment. And we've been couching H5P uh, during the symposium as a keen tool to provide formative assessment for students. Now, you know me, I, I, I enjoy data. So I went and looked at, there are some new meta-analyses. Um, Argo Vol, who does a lot of really good research in pedagogical innovation. Phelps, having done two meta-analyses from 2012 and 2019, found that formative assessment is amplified when you include feedback. And so over here, once again, trying to, um, want to contextualize the size of this feedback, we see that the testing effect so just providing practice questions like we know is really good um, uh, uh, practice. We spoke yesterday how this can lead to 10% improvement in grades. Just providing a testing effect without anything more than corrective feedback in a formative assessment leads to a huge improvement in summative assessment later on. However, when we... <laughs> I didn't plant you at all, Tamara, but that was really great that you asked the question exactly when you did. So thank you for not ask the question when you when you gave us that insight. Um, however, when we give this descriptive feedback in the testing effect and formative assessment, and we make this nice and descriptive, um, we see once again a huge increase to almost a standard deviation improvement. And when your summative assessments, for instance, uh, my midterm has a fourteen percent standard deviation. Um, I'm sure you ask any student if they want uh, a fourteen percent higher grade uh, or some equivalent of that. 
um, and they will say, yes, please. And so I see something's immediately gone wrong with my, um, my uh, what you call it, um, animations there. Feedback informative assessment is inherently powerful because it tends to be task level feedback rather than sort of summary feedback on they've handed something in and this is a summary of what went well and what didn't go well with no chance for improvement. But if you're performing a task and this is where sort of some timing comes in because task level feedback is inherently immediate in nature, um, we see that students are able to correct misconceptions or see misconceptions in the here and now. This tends to be educative in nature because you're able to find out what these misconceptions are and then correct those right there and then. Uh, one of the other problems when looking at this um, literature where um, we look at feedback within um, summative assessment opportunities and if we saw in some of those Reddit posts earlier on is that students don't often find the feedback useful because it's written in a way that's super convoluted, that's not easy for them uh, to understand. And so uh, when we are looking at feedback informative assessment, um, we need to make sure that the feedback is useful, written in a way that the student can understand. Another thing that we found within the, the examples that you all gave, thank you very much for giving those examples um, at the beginning of the session, is that any type of feedback that has these kind of behaviors principles where you are rewarding or punishing something, we need to make sure that it is not the student that we are rewarding. Um, research shows that if you have a student and they performed well on a test and you say, well done, you are very smart, you are encouraging something that is essentially seen as unchanging. I am already brilliant. So why should I try for my next assessment? And we see that this type of praise, it um, increases what's known as extrinsic motivation. So this motivation that comes from external. Um, I am not doing this because I want to get good grades, but I'm doing this because I want to get praise. But if you're praising the thing that is seen as somewhat stable, I'm already a genius, I don't need to try. Subsequently, we see when you praise the, the, the child or the student rather than the process, performance decreases subsequently. But if you praise the process, wow, you studied really hard. What were the study techniques that you used? I see you're working hard on this. This then shows and signals to the student exactly what they are doing that is working. And then they know to repeat those. And we see that this type of praising the process increases this intrinsic motivation which is what I think we are all trying to cultivate a love for learning in our students and understanding and the thirst for knowledge. And a lot of that comes from intrinsic motivation. So praising the process does indeed um, increase intrinsic motivation. At the same time, um, I know that there is research published on this. I'm sorry that I couldn't find my, um, my references for this part, but we see that also you don't want to criticize the students that was a stupid mistake. What are you doing in this class? Are you even, even trying? Um, really demotivate students to the point where they may drop out. Uh, so if you do need to level some sort of criticism, make sure that it's focused on the process. Um, I see that there is some trouble understanding um, SN1 reactions. And so focus on looking at um, understanding this point of that, right? So um, you know, often when students come to me and say, how can I improve my performance on the midterm? I ask, what are the study techniques? And they say, oh, I read and reread. And I say, you know, well, um, that's not the most effective technique. While we do need to read our assignment, uh, I think our, what you call it, the, the pages to get the information in, we then need to make our brain work. And so here are some things that you can try out. So once again, um, I make a very big point of trying to say, well, look, you know, this is not a reflection of you. This grade is not a reflection of you, but rather the processes that are, are going on. And those are easy to fix. And then this is something that sort of, you know, in developing a session with, with Kaylee, we spoke a lot about. Um, and this ties into what we spoke about yesterday as well. If you've written really good distractors, these distractors should be based 
uncommon misconceptions that you know exist. And so if you write these good distractors, you should be able to predict why a student chose the answer and then be prepared to write to that common misconception. And so this is, um, hopefully, this is just a couple of bullet points that can help us orient ourselves to writing feedback that is. Um... So do you think AI can create good distractors? I think AI can create good distractors. Um, but as with everything, it needs to have a, an eye cast over it by, by the instructor. And that's sort of what I was thinking with in terms of feedback, which I asked um, Sventora, is that you know we, we clearly know there's a lot of literature on providing good feedback. And I would have tweaked some of the feedback in the Northern Lights or in the Sun saying that um, you don't find a lot of carbon in the Sun. It's not abundant. Then they went to say, say you know, like helium and hydrogen is abundant. And for me, while well, I think that that's fine, providing these hints as to what the answer might be, I would have probably stopped at saying, well, um, yes, we do find carbon in the sun, but it's not in abundance. Which element do we find in abundance? Distractors must be plausible to students at a particular level. That's right. And so I think a lot of these things with this AI-generated stuff, and Sven Tor, kind of, Torre spoke about this as well, is um, you need to go and review this stuff. And so you need to review the distractors as well. Um, and then, you know, sort of when I've asked, I've been playing around with ChatGPT and how it can help me write better distractors, um, I might ask ChatGPT to include a distractor about this misconception. And then it's pretty good at integrating the distractor into the question for these formative assessment pieces. So I think AI can create good distractors, but one of the problems that we know with AI is that AI is based on a corpus of knowledge and um, billions and billions of paper. And there was an article released, I think, in Science early this year, looking at how stereotypes against different groups, while the stereotypes may have changed about what stereotypes are held towards white individuals or black individuals or men versus women, the stereotypes, the words that have used have changed over the past 200 years in written texts. You look at the valence, whether they are positive or negative, that has remained constant over 200 years. And so we're getting this AI to learn from these texts that are written by humans, and humans have these biases that can lead to um, uh, um, sort of creating these distractors that Lily was talking about that can be threatening to certain students. And so I think it's um, of paramount importance that we read over the distractors and the feedback with a critical eye, of, with a critical eye towards um, EDI issues so that we can uh, catch any of those in, in before they get make it out to the student. Very good question. Thank you for asking. I hope I answered it. Um, I spoke for long. <laughs> so now we've looked at the role that um, assessment plays within formative feedback. Um, it plays a really important role, once again, boosting up um, uh, the effect size of um, these kind of practice tests that we give students. The next question I'd like to start looking at is, do we, should we use text feedback or should we use audio feedback? And I've included this in because, you know, it was mentioned in Cynthia Brain's workshop yesterday, this, um, you know, sort of the theme to this symposium is creating interactive videos. Um, I, you know, sort of interactive videos allow us to create the opportunity to provide verbal feedback. And is there anything over and above providing ver verbal feedback or written feedback, that there's something special in verbal feedback or is written feedback enough? So we can see these interactive videos can allow you to build on prior knowledge. One thing I really like about what uh, the videos that Kaylee has done is that um, especially for sort of naming, uh, um, uh, naming um, molecules in chemistry using nomenclature, you need to understand certain parts before you build up to the next part. And having someone sort of talk about feedback is almost like another mini little um, education. And so, you know, getting something wrong then provides another opportunity um, for students to learn. 
And so, as I said earlier, I personally don't like providing the correct answers. I don't like providing very strong hints towards the correct answer because the literature shows the more we can make our students think, the stronger the, um, uh, the connections are made and, and, and the greater learning takes place. Um, but rather, I like to tell them why the chosen answer is incorrect. And so, for instance, um, in the sleep disorders video that we looked at yesterday, if I may quickly show it over here. I'm quickly going to forward to this one. Hey, Doc. I was taking the history of patient number one, and they fell asleep. Am I really boring? And so over here, which sleep disorder is characterized by suddenly falling asleep? Now, the answer is narcolepsy, but let's say someone says somnambulism. They click on somnambulism. And over here, um, the feedback that I've given is the etymology of the word somnambulism gives us a good clue as to what it is. Somnus is the Latin for sleep, where ambular is the Latin for to walk. The current patient seems to be doing some sleeping, so that's acknowledging what they got right, um, but they're not doing a lot of walking. Wa uh, walking, try again. So then students can click on this. They can try again. REM behavior sleep disorder, check. REM sleep behavior disorder refers to something that happens during REM sleep. The patient cannot seem to stay awake, which is the issue over here. Try again, and eventually they hit upon narcolepsy, and they check that. Now, what I also like to build in um, to this feedback on a correct item is um, other sort of cognitive psychological tricks that lead to greater learning. So over here, instead of just saying correct and having them move on, I ask a probing question. What is the process of suddenly falling asleep called? And hopefully the student will say, oh, that's called a sleep attack. Or if they're not sure what it's called, when they relearn the stuff, they know, oh, I need to look at what this um, process of suddenly falling asleep is called. And then they move on. Oh, narcolepsy. So there's an example. Does that mean they work for the Here's an example of um, written feedback. When we go look at spoken feedback, um, I won't show this too much uh, because I know that you, Kaylee showed it yesterday, but for those of you who weren't able to make it yesterday. Uh, hey doc, your EEG um, e -E machine thingy is beeping. What does this mean? So this is a bit of a roundabout question. I felt a bit mean putting this in because A, this is a um, sleep spindle. And so students should be able to identify that that's a sleep spindle and know that sleep spindles occur during stage two. The student clicks on stage one. When we're awake and alert, our brains exhibit beta waves. In stage one of sleep, we would expect to see alpha waves, which are lower in frequency and higher in amplitude than beta waves. As the patient continued in stage one, we would also expect to see theta waves, which are even lower in frequency and somewhat higher in amplitude. In the EEG that Preston showed, the patient does seem to exhibit theta waves, but there is also a burst of high frequency, high amplitude activity that is not consistent with stage one sleep. Which stage of sleep involves theta waves as well as brief bursts of electrical activity? So what I like about this is that you can see the, the feedback acknowledges what was, you know, where they might have thought it was stage one, that it was in theta waves, and that they do see theta waves over here. But then without giving the question, it gives a little bit more information, a little bit more of a learning opportunity um, before providing the opportunity to take again. So I've just shown you two videos. One is what we refer to as like a traditional interactive video. That's where it pauses and asks a question, and then you can um, give your answer and you can move on. If you get it wrong, it gives text feedback, right? Which one do you use? This interactive where it gives text feedback, or this what we call this branching interactive, where if a question is wrong, it branches off to a mini explanation. Um, so which one should you use? Is it really worth putting in all the hassle to make a branching interactive? or um, do interactives work well? And so uh, Kaylee said that we would um, speak a little bit about a lab study that we ran um, last uh, about two years ago. And we were looking at this um, uh, sort of seminal paper by Rudiger and Karpiki in 2006 showing the Dewar effect 
lasted one day, five days, uh, two days to five days later, people who had done practice quizzes outperformed those who just studied and restudied the material. So we built our study um, on this, where we had students come in and read the material first, then they did a two-minute distractor task, and then they either reread the material, they watched a traditional video, so the, the one on stages of sleep, we made that into traditional video that just played out and gave all the answers, didn't stop and prod for information, versus an interactive video that stopped, asked questions, and then gave text feedback versus branching interactive video that then would move on and give um, a little explanation. We had 408 students come for part one, and then we had uh, 339 students re return a week later for part two. So as I said, all students read a Stages of Sleep, a passage on Stages of Sleep from the OpenStax textbook. We then got them, similar to the Rudigan Karpiki study, to do two minutes of math tasks, um, which was a very popular part of the study by all people. And then we either got students to reread the same passage, or they watched this, inter uh, this uh, traditional video, or they watched the same traditional video, but with some interactivity embedded where it stopped and asked for questions with text feedback, or they watched this branching interactive video. We then got them, because it was so popular, we got them to do another two minutes of math tasks. And then to half of them, we gave them a test, a multiple choice question test, and then a um, write down as much information as you can remember. And then we asked them, how did they find um, the study? The other half of them, we just gave them the survey. One week later, we called all the students back, uh, all the participants back, and we got them all to take a multiple choice quest on question on a test on the, the topic that they'd done a week earlier. Um, and they did the multiple choice question, and then they wrote down as much information as they could remember. We then showed all the students, you know, here, this is, uh, we had some of you reread the material again. Uh, we also had some of you watch a traditional video. Here's the traditional video. Some of you watch this interactive. Here's this interactive. Some of you watch this branching interactive. Here's this branching interactive. And once again, we asked, which was your preference? Which one would you prefer to study from? Which do you think is better? Which provided you with most control? For the first time that they came in, remember we said we did the, the manipulations and then we got them to fill out a survey. We asked overall, the video helped me understand stages of sleep. The video was enjoyable. The video was uh, effective. Those of the who read the text twice said the text was effective, the text was enjoyable. I had control over the pace of my learning when watching the video or reading the text. The pace of the video, the pace of the text was appropriate. Um, I was able to master each concept before moving on to the next one. I'm going to show you a lot of results here. This is better understand, was enjoyable, was effective, had control, appropriate master. These are students who read the text first and then read the text again. Those who read the text watched the traditional video. Those that read the text did the interactive video. Those that read the text and did the branching interactive video. And then higher numbers refer to better understanding, more enjoyable, better effect, um, more efficacious. So over here, when we see better understand, students felt, at least students who had read the material twice, felt that they were able to better understand the material from reading a text, which makes sense because the text has all the material there. When it came to enjoyability, they found that they surprisingly enjoyed the traditional video the least. They enjoyed the branching video the most, but we can see it's not a lot of gains over those who read the text. In terms of how effective it was at helping them learn, we see that these branching videos and these interactive videos um, outperformed both a traditional video and outperformed the um, text. Now, what's really interesting is that obviously, if I give you something to read, you have control over how quickly you read. So I was expecting text to have the highest control, but here we actually see that it was the branching video and the branching interact the interactive video that had the most control. Students felt they had the most control over the pace, much more so than the students had read the text. Here we see that those who had the interactive video found that it was um, appropriate. And when it looks at mastery, students in the interactive and the branching interactive felt that they were able to master the material more. And this replicates those three studies that Katie showed yesterday during, during her workshop on the effect, effectiveness of interactive videos. 
Now, this is the second when they all knew that there were texts, there was a traditional video interactive and branching it, um, video. And we can see that when students knew of all the options that were available, they showed the stronger preference. They said that interactive and branching interactive were the most effective, the most enjoyable, the most engaging, and their preferred style. Now, one thing I would like to point out is that for three out of the four of them, you can see that this branching interactive video is statistically higher than the interactive video, but not by an astounding amount, right? Um, and I'll return to this a little bit later. But now in terms of feedback, in terms of what I want to get across today, uh, the feedback in the interactive video, which was text feedback, and the feedback in the branching interactive video, which was spoken, were near identical. We tried as much as possible to have verbatim feedback so that it wasn't something that one group was getting different feedback, and that's what led to um, uh, feedback. So over here, the interactive video and the branching interactive video, the feedback was near identical. The only thing that differed was, did they read it or did they listen to it? And we want to know, did the students receive perceive the feedback as more personal when it was during written in text or when it was spoken to them in like a mini lecture? And over here, we see a Cohen's D of 0.7 difference in that it was almost verbatim the same feedback, but when it was spoken to them, they found it so much more personal than when it was interactive. And this supports what Mayer calls the personalization principle. And Mayer was um, put forward the, the model that Cynthia Brain spoke about a lot yesterday, that when students feel that there is um, this personalized feedback has a larger effect because they feel that there's more of a social partnership with the narrator, and that leads to increase in motivation and greater effort. So over here, we see a clear winner that the branching interactive video um, is superior in terms of feedback, uh, in terms of how personalized it felt for the students. We then ask students to give some feedback. And so over here, they said, it's really interesting. It actually made me laugh and kept me engaged. The integration of video-based feedback also seemed like an extra practice situation instead of the process of elimination since you got a question wrong. It seemed to provide more information and context about the right answer. So here students, you know, we didn't ask about feedback. We said, how did you find the videos? And this one voluntarily offered up um, that the feedback was particularly important in providing more information, extra practice, and context as to the right answer, even though it didn't give the right answer, right? The feedback seemed more personalized when the answer was wrong, and I was able to pinpoint exactly where my thought process went wrong with an in-depth video explanation of the correct answer. And quite often, these explanations were less than 40 seconds, and they found this quite in-depth. I was able to learn more information each time I made a mistake in a way that helped me learn and remember. So here, we see that in terms of feedback, um, these interactives do give good feedback, and we see that it has these beneficial effects. But when you are able to make it spoken and more personalized, that seems to um, uh, have benefits on students. So we see these clear differences in, in personalization of feedback, but we don't see these clear differences in effect. We see both interactive and branching interactives were more effective, more enjoyable, better mastery. And we see some gains in um, branching interactive videos. Um, but which ones should you use? We see that whether you choose branching in interactive videos or just plain interactive videos, they perform significantly better than text and than traditional video in several metrics. Um, students felt that these interactive forms were best, especially showing a preference for branching interactive. Um, but we see the gains of branching interactive, while significant, were often small but the power was really lying in this personalization. And so when we're kind of trying to figure out, well, which one do I use? I feel that it's important to bring up some other feedback that students gave. And so over here, it feels like the interactive videos are the best combination of being engaging and time efficient. So some students found it a little bit laborious going through this branching interactive that then stopped to explain and kept them as a captive audience. Now, whether we want to do that, remember, um, in, 
in Cynthia's talk yesterday, Cynthia Bram's talk yesterday, she said the more you can sort of force students to ask answer questions, the better the effect is. Um, I'm not sure what, you know, forcing them to listen to feedback versus read feedback, but even though students might have a preference for being more time efficient, um, it might be better to, to have the less time efficient one. But, you know, we see shorter time than branch interactive video and can do some extra practice questions. And another student said it's more engaging and involves more recall than simply reading the text or just watching a traditional video, but at the same time, not as time consuming as branch interactive videos. And so, you know, students, I think, often have to do these hedonic calculuses as to where they are going to put their time when they're studying, especially when, you know, it's midterm week. When reading week starts, ends next week, we're going to go into the second wave of midterm week, and they're going to have a lot of things pulling at their time. And so these branching interactives might be really good for the first time or two or three um, going through. Some participants anecdotally said that they actually got questions wrong so they could see the explanations. So they actually purposely got things wrong so they could have these learning opportunities. But then that might frustrate other students in that it's time consuming. So I don't think, I think branching interactive, that's what I generally have a clear preference for, but I don't think that it is useful in any situation, in every situation, I should say. Not useful in every situation or not more useful than interactive videos, um, especially with some of the time investment it takes to planning it out. As Kaylee showed you yesterday, you can copy and paste things pretty quickly. And once you get into the flow of things, it goes by pretty quickly, but it's often the planning out stage uh, that takes a fair amount of time where interactive videos allow you to um, just pop questions in and still get those benefits. Did you look at whether they actually did spend more time on branching videos than interactive, or they perceived that they did because the video is longer since include branches? That's a very good question. Um, we don't have any sort of, uh, because H5P, the way that it functions at the moment, we were not able to get data to how they interacted with the video. That is possible to do using things called XAPI statements or various other ways of going and sort of pulling interactivity. So we would be able to get which questions they chose, how many times they hit pause, rewind, play. Um, that's what we're hoping to do for a future study, but we weren't able to do that for this um, study per se. And so, um, you know, it was an anecdotal uh, students during the experiments have told me or the research assistants that sometimes they were getting things wrong so that they could actually see, um, you know, more of the video. But I don't have any hard data that I can show that uh, to you. Now, sometimes we might not want to provide feedback. When might we not want to provide feedback? Um, Mark McDaniel, who was the keynote for the symposium two years ago, told us about a study where he got participants to come in and read a section on research methods. Two days later, they brought participants back in and they got some of their participants to study the material for six minutes, do a little distracting task, study the video for six minutes again, do a distracting task, then read the, the material again. So this was just study, study, study. The other half of the participants did a multiple choice question, then they studied the material and then they did some multiple choice questions again. Now you see that these center studies are highlighted in red. That's because what they did is that when they studied the material in the middle section, they gave highlighters. And then they looked at which um, uh, terms students were highlighting. So this is sort of if students study and then study again, do they know what they don't know? And does this bear out in their patterns of highlighting key terms? Versus if you do a multiple choice question before studying the material again, you it points very clearly to where your lack of understanding is. And then does this bear out in how they read the material? Now, these multiple choice questions just provided corrective feedback. They didn't do any of this um, nice descriptive feedback. And as I said in this read that they highlighted. Five days later, they came back and wrote a quiz on the material again. So over here, we can see uh, the proportion of content that was highlighted um, correct during the first multiple choice question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So over here, what we see is that students who got the multiple choice question 
um, they highlighted about 44% of the key terms that they got correct. But the students who started out with a multiple choice question and then restudied the material, they highlighted 78% of the material that they'd gotten incorrect. So McDaniel talks about meta memory, how these multiple choice questions at the beginning of a study question can point to gaps in student knowledge, which then makes their studying a lot more efficient. And when we look at their test scores five days later, you can see those who are in the study, study, study group didn't have that prompting of meta memory, scored 63%, where those who took the test, then we studied the material, and then took the test five days later, scored 10% higher. So sometimes we want to give this descriptive feedback, but sometimes we can think about using videos or interactive videos in ways before reading a section. So if I can show you an example of what that might look like. Um, over here, this is uh, chapter eight, analyzing findings. Students then go into correlational research, and before they read all the material on correlational research, um, over here, I get them to watch a video. Now they can choose, do they want to watch the interactive video or do they want to watch the non-interactive video? So if they click on the non-interactive video, it goes to a video on correlations. But over here, if they start the course and they click on interactive video, this goes to a video that then stops and asks them questions. You can see this is from a video that my, my colleague Stephen Barnes put up on YouTube. So this is one that I pulled off YouTube and retrofitted some interactivity. So this is, what I, this is what it looks like. So it starts off right at the beginning. Before we begin, which of the following options best describes what a correlation is? So over here, a correlation of forms about how a participant scored in the test. This does give a little bit of feedback. This is incorrect. We can use a correlation to find out what is related to test performance, but it doesn't tell us how someone performs. So they can retry. Um, informs us about a correlation uh, relationship between two variables. Yes, a correlation tells us two variables are related to each other and how they are related and the strength of the relationship. You'll learn more about this next time. So here, this is hopefully creating some meta memory. And then they get- So let's talk videos. about correlation. Here is a scatterplot graph. This may look like a very organized view of the night sky, but it's actually a treasure trove of information. With a graph like this, you can figure out the correlation between two variables, be it positive, negative, or none, and you can make predictions about data. First, if your graph looks like this, then you have a positive correlation. As x increases, y also increases. So then I pause over here and I say, what is another possible interpretation? And this would be over here. A decrease in the variable on the x-axis is associated with decrease in the variable of the y-axis. So this is trying to get students to read a positive correlation in both ways. Just because a positive, it doesn't always mean as one increases, the other one increases. It's just that they move in the same direction. If x decreases, then y also decreases. If they get it wrong, there's no feedback, and it tells them what it is. Um, and then it asks for another example of a positive correlation. And so this is the idea to get them to think, well, what is wrong? Oh, why is that wrong? And then to listen more and then to read on to find it out. So that's how I used um, this to provide feedback uh, to try and serve this purpose of meta memory. And you, you can kind of see, I try to talk about that. Providing high quality feedback is time consuming for, um, for the person giving it. Um, and I think Hattie mentioned that in, the, um, in some of their papers. And that's what I quite like about H5P is that it does allow you to provide bulk feedback to students. So for instance, if we look at multiple choice questions, supports detailed feedback, multiple choice questions, yes, it does. Single choice and image choice, it doesn't provide detailed feedback, but it does provide, say, for instance, corrective feedback, where a question set does allow um, the provision of um, detailed feedback. You can look at short answer style questions, fill in the blank, prov uh, provides corrective feedback, advanced fill in the blank, provides some, um, more descriptive feedback. I think that there are workarounds in which you are able to provide more detailed feedback there. Hotspot style questions supports detailed feedback, image 
Hotspot provides corrective feedback, but find this hotspot and find multiple hotspots provide um, these detailed feedback. And then flashcard styles, once again, this is only corrective feedback. Within interactive videos, we can see um, that multiple choice questions, crossroads, and navigation, in some sense, provide the ability for descriptive feedback, whereas image, choice, uh, true and false, and statements, single choice set, provide corrective feedback unless you do these branching interactives. So there are all of these um, decisions that need to be made. And um, you know, this H5P offers one opportunity to doing this, especially if you're trying to think of how we can create these things that then provide this type of feedback for students, that we can provide good detailed descriptive feedback but in a way that is manageable for everyone. So the summary feedback is important at both summative and formative, uh, shouldn't say research, that should say research shows in summative and formative tests. We should aim for descriptive over evaluative feedback. Um, feedback needs to be understandable, contain correct information and focus on the material. Formative is especially important because uh, encourage the read, it encourages reading and taking in of feedback. Uh, branching interactive videos can be easily effective at personalizing feedback, but they do come at a significant time cost. Sometimes no feedback beyond corrective can also enhance learning if it's used in um, correct ways. So that's the end of the talk. I know that we've got about another 25 minutes here. And so what I thought I would do is that maybe I would head into H5P and start looking at, well, how might we create some of this feedback? Uh, within um, H5P, especially if we might be using something like um, uh, what Sven Toro was saying, this generation, how can we go and change any of the feedback that might, we might want to do? So over here, this is some of the materials that we're going to be using. Those of you who want to go into your H5P instance are welcome to follow along here. And uh, then what I'll show you to do is how you might be able to go and copy so over here we've got our question over here if you click on an answer it shows incorrect we want to put some feedback how do we go putting feedback over here so if you click on this now uh, once again i'm in firefox um, sometimes cultura videos don't like working in firefox so i've taken this over to chrome and there's the interactive video if you'd like to use this interactive video to follow along with me, you can click on this reuse button. And you can either download as an H5P file, which then you can upload, or you can just copy content. So for now, I would um, encourage you to click on copy content and then go back to your instance of H5P. You will then. I'm just going to pipe in for a minute. I think that if somebody is using. Um that to, to use that copy button you that will work for you simon because you're within your own um h5p but i think it might not work for others um until unless that h5p element was their own in their own uh, like where they were authoring h5p and so instead they'd need to click reuse and click the download and okay. then they could upload it to have a their own instance of that okay. there the copy button should just work within when you are the one editing your own H5P items within your own author, within the same authoring tool. So it might not work for others. Okay, excellent. So then if you click on reuse and you download, you can see in the download history, that's where the interactive video has gone. Uh, we then click on add new in our instance of H5P. And you will click on, you see this H5P select content type, create content, you can click on upload. Click on upload a file over here. You double click on that and click on use. Interactive video was successfully uploaded and there you have that um, available. And there's that one interaction that we were talking about over there. So there are two ways in which you can um, go about doing that. If one doesn't work, try the other. You go reuse, copy content, go to add new. You could also just click paste over here. And then that's it. Uh, and then you can correct my spelling, interactive video. Remember from um, a EDI perspective, we might want to give more of a description over here. Um, this one covers material on various sleeping disorders. Uh, Takes some tracks. 
over there we see that there's the web vtt so that's the closed caption should be there for you already as well now we're going to click on interactions we're going to click on the little bubble that then calls this up and we are going to double click on this so it pulls it up you see the pause video we've got the poster interaction and here are all of our questions with the correct one being narcolepsy over here we want to add the feedback nice this is what um what is the process of suddenly falling asleep called you click on tips and feedback message displayed if answer is selected we will put that in over there you'll see that there's no chance for doing a heading over here um, that is because it's less important for the answer to have a heading but more important for the question to have a heading to make it um, latch onable for keyboard shortcuts so if you would use the same title of HVP that I've already used, I imagine if you don't have that instance in your um, H5P instance already, if you don't have that name, it will just call it um, interactive video with the spelling mistake. So I don't think it will override it. It might have a copy of it. I'm not too sure um, what it will do if there's a second instance of it. But if you do already have that name, I don't think that it's going to care what the name of it is because it will still have a unique H5P ID, which is how H5P ident it gives a little ID number to each um, different element that you create. So I don't think it would care whether the title was repeated because it would have a different ID element, an ID tag. So you can see over here at the end of this, um, where it's being hosted, you see ID equals 3168. If I were to change that to something different, um, then we might find a different H5P instance. But you can see that that's the ID tag that Katie was talking about. All right, so over here, you can also do message displayed if correct answer is not selected. Um, this can be quite powerful sometimes. You know, if you, I find it easier to think about it in terms of like if you've got um, a true false and you've only got two answers, and then you might be able to say, um, uh, well done on not falling for the red herring. So which one is not a psychological myth that we only use 10% of our brain or, um, or that uh, writing material in bold and italics uh, makes it more difficult to read, which promotes learning. And so, um, you know, if you select that second one, that would be true. That would be the correct answer. And you could have, well, well done for not falling to this myth. Um, and then have a little bit of an explanation. A tip text, that's what Sven Tor was showing earlier. Um, uh, you can type something like uh, something to try and, and give a hint, which will appear as that little speech bubble. Sleep apnea over here. Uh, so sleep apnea. Ooh, I don't have that uh, the feedback copied over here. REM sleep behavior disorder, REM sleep behavior disorder, copy. And paste. Somnambulism is sleepwalking over there. Uh, night terrors over there. Copy and paste. What you can also do is that you can sort of say feedback. If the students score somewhere between 0% and 100%, you can give them some feedback. You can also add a range 0 to 20%. You could say, um, uh, I would focus uh, uh, um, focus on reading section XX on sleep disorders and then try again. And then at another range from 20 to 50% saying you have, uh, we're trying to avoid the value of one over here. Um, uh, once again, you, oh, you might actually just say, why make things difficult for myself? Zero to 50%, 50 to 70%, you could say you have an understanding of the material, go and read the material again to bump up your focus. And then if it's uh, between 71 and 100%. So there are ways in which you can give this. I find this particularly good when you're using a question set where you can have like multiple, multiple choice questions there. Um, you can give them feedback on the overall task. Once you've done that, you scroll up to the top and you click on the done button and you click on the create button. I'm going to put up one more thing that I'd like to show you before I'm going to stop talking and open up to questions. And so then 
when we press play, we move across to there, which sleep disorder is characterized by suddenly falling asleep. If we go on to somnambulism, there is the, uh, what you call it, the, the feedback now. Try again. This is uh, narcolepsy. Check. Correct. And there's your feedback. And so this is now um, just a nice way of providing sort of like personalized feedback. If they get one wrong, you're able to tell a little bit of specifics about that, created into a learning opportunity. Um, uh, one thing that we don't want to do is that you want to be careful on the language that you use, because if you have any of this evaluative that has this judgment or this negative or this criticism, that can demotivate students to actually try um, at all. And so um, it allows you to personalize for these different ones. And as I say, if you create these types of distractors, you know why the student might have chosen them. So you can say what they got correct, but then focus on the part that maybe they, um, they hadn't got correct. One more that I would like to show you, and I, um, this one is particularly powerful, uh, and I would encourage you to play around with, and I didn't, I know Ka Kaylee is very good at using this, uh, but you get this H5P widget, which is um, an essay question, I believe, Kaylee? Yes. Yeah. So over here, having just learned about sleep apnea, so here they read about sleep apnea, Having just learned about sleep apnea, try to write down as much information as you can answering the following questions. So very similar to Cynthia Brain, this is kind of telling students what is expected of them um, in this one. And over here, you can say sleep apnea describes a condition whereby you can give students a sentence to start off with. So sleep apnea is a condition whereby a person stops breathing for uh, 10 to 20 seconds at night. Um, is there more than one type of sleep apnea? Well, there is central and uh, obstructive sleep. Whoopsie. Sleep apnea. Now, let's say that's all I can remember. When I click check, it says over here, well done, stop reading, well done. This is a defining feature. So you've got the defining feature, 10 to 20 seconds. You mentioned uh, another defining feature or how long it lasts for. Congratulations. Did you get the description of central sleep apnea correct? Well done. Did you get the description of corrective? And then there were some other things that they didn't fill in. You seem to have missed out on defining diagnostic feature of obst obstructive sleep apnea. What could it be? So you can give students hints as to um, where they might be lacking, helping them focus, rereading the material, or maybe even trying that again. And then what you can also do is have a show solution button where you can write, for instance, this is what a sample solution would be like, and students can see what that might be. There are multiple ways in which you can provide feedback on these individual ones, on the task as a whole. And we see different H5P widgets have these different abilities to provide correct feedback versus descriptive feedback. And uh, we see that some of these widgets can provide a real nice bit of feedback as to points that students hit, trying to build in as many of these good practices as possible. And so that has brought me to the end of what I had planned for today.